what they have and moving to a million. And so um, what, what we really focused and saw a need for in the marketplace was we saw many, many women um, opting out of corporate, older women, younger women wanting to join in this entrepreneurial journey. However, the stats haven't changed in 15 years about the success rates. And in fact, it, you know, we can, depending on the source, but anywhere from 85 to 90 percent of women that start businesses go out of business within three years in Canada. And Canada is um, often, uh, you know, positioned as the leader of entrepreneurial activity for women or certainly in the top five around the world. So I thought, uh, well, what a great opportunity to help Canadian women truly realize their dream and realize their dream by doing and starting up and driving sustainable revenue streams. So just briefly about my background, I, I sold the first cell phones in Canada. I uh, worked for this incredible t uh, company called Motorola, at and I ran up the corporate ladder in sales and marketing because I was uh, given the opportunity for every early adopting technology that was brought to market and it was brought to market in rough, crude, uh, ways that most times it didn't work, but it was brought to market. We had to find a critical niche, drive a revenue stream, and then thus become ubiquitous. As we all know and enjoy, that cell phone today is not a telephone. We all enjoy video conferencing. Initially, those solutions cost upwards to three quarters of a million dollars. They cost, well, it's free on your cell phone today. So my expertise, like Duenia says, we all have areas of expertise to share with one another and help. Mine is in putting together disruptive models of innovation for women entrepreneurs to go to market as a startup entrepreneur and drive, put a foundation in place that enables her business to be three to five, in three to five years, a million dollars. One more stat. Uh, after corporate, I had a great corporate uh, stint. However, towards the end, I, I was, uh, I had to opt, chose to opt out and get into the world of startups and become an entrepreneur myself. My first business was over a million in under two years. Um, and so I didn't realize myself it was a great opportunity. It was a good business. Uh, however, when I was coming close to uh, my 50 years old, I realized I wanted to do something that was truly meaningful for me for the rest of my life. And then I realized all that background in sales, marketing, selling disruption, innovation, technology, all of that is not because I am a... Um, uh, you know, really a lover of technology, it was because I could get the experience, gain, learn, and bring it all back and deliver it to women in my backyard and around the world. So thank you for joining me. It's four years later. I've opened up Women on the Move, a place, it's the only business accelerator for women in Canada. I want to start off by saying I am not funded by any government. I am not a nonprofit. I am for profit and I teach for profit business models. And the program that has we put together after working with several women entrepreneurs that are extremely successful in terms of gaining the momentum and the sustainability is called Moving to a Million. And after our presentation today, uh, I hope that most of you will see a different way of going about true funding of your business and why this is a critical piece, obviously, and really what we believe is the most sustainable, successful model for your funding. And at the end of the day, we're saying moving to a million, it's not about having a million dollars in your bank account. That's not why we're doing it. We're doing it so we can fuel our ideas, fuel our creativity, fuel our innovation and put sustainability in our businesses so that our great ideas come to market, have impact in the market and don't stop. And you continue to have the resources you need to grow your business in the way and the direction that you choose to grow your business. All in all, all of that leads up to one thing, one thing only, and it's called gross national happiness for women. At the end of the day, that's what I'm here to encourage, to role model, to lead, and to extend and share and mobilize for every single woman that we can. My delivery mechanism is through helping women entrepreneurs. So that's the intro. That was a great intro. <laughs> And I love the gross national happiness for women. It's like putting a spin on GDP. It's GNH. <laughs> I love it. Well, it really is con. I didn't, I, I borrow most of my concepts. And this concept is for, from a company called Bhutan. 
And Bhutan is known and widely recognized and really studied from the United Nations because they don't measure gross domestic product. They don't do that. They measure gross national happiness. And they have a very elaborate, very complex uh, methodology for doing that. And so if anyone's interested, I really encourage you to go and find out more about Bhutan. It is truly, truly uh, a fascinating model. I believe it's a, you know, what's required is a blend of both, but all in all, I'm here to help and spread gross national happiness for women. Excellent. I will go to your next slide. Thank you. Many of the women that come into our business accelerator, I have sat down and uh, you know, interviewed more than 1,200 in the past four years. And I can tell you that many of them say to me, but Heather, what if I fail? That is the first go-to. What if I fail? And I say, what if you fly? What if you fly? And wouldn't, isn't that the world we want to live in? Isn't that the world we want for our daughters and nieces and all of our um, younger women to follow? We want them to say, what if I fly? So we have to eradicate that thinking, change that thinking. It's not about what if I fail is your first go-to. Your first go-to should be, hmm, what if I fly? What if? So that's the context. That's simply a slide that I'm, I like to always leave behind um, with some inspirational. And I, I love TED Talks. I love Do Lectures. And those are just some of my favorites. So I just want you to have those um, uh, for your resource. We're not going to go over them or through them, but they're just some of my recent favorites. And I'm sure many of you enjoy many, many TED Talks and Do Lectures. And I find if you're ever having one of those days, if you're ever, uh, you know, feeling a little less than in whatever way, go listen to a TED Talk and a Do Lecture and they'll get you in the, back in the mood of flying. Sorry, I'm advancing. That's okay. So the agenda that I put together to share with you today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of women, small, medium enterprises in Canada, why women make excellent entrepreneurs and most don't even realize it, pressing problems for women, small, medium enterprises in Canada, funding paths and pitfalls, how to overcome funding problems, and how to seek and secure funding. So the current state, I mentioned this a little bit in my introductory remarks, is that less than 1% of women, small, medium enterprises in Canada reach a million in revenue. This was quite alarming to me. And I feel that there's a lot of old mental uh, stigmas that go into this because I can tell you there is nothing, nothing that you cannot, a million is no big deal. I'm not saying that frivolously in any way. It's not a magic potion, but there are disciplined methodologies to go to market. And a million is really the point at which you do have the resource to invest in your business, invest in your employees, invest in your customers to continuously improve and deliver the fantastic products, services, uh, offers and innovation that you are here to do. 84% of women go out of business within three years. Women start businesses different reasons than men. This is great. Right, there are a number of, um, of reports that do this. And my most recent is the APAC Forum, Asia Pacific Economic Council that we are part, Canada's part of as, as along with 20 other countries. It is well recognized and it has been well disputed for years, but women start business for different reasons. Generally, they start business because they see an opportunity to change, disrupt, do it differently. They do not start business to say, I want to make a million dollars and here's my exit plan. That is not their methodology. Of course, they have to be sustainable in, in terms of revenue, but their go-to first reason they want to start a business is to change something. Quite frankly, that's called innovation. Women often do not realize their own potential, the innovative co-creators bringing, bringing their products and services to market. Too many times they've been told, who do you think you are? I, how are you ever going to do this? And, and dissuaded. And I'm here to tell you over and over in every way we can, 
Get rid of that clutter. What if you fly? You are the innovation. Our country looks for innovation in the economy all the time. And guess what? It's right in front of each and every woman. She is the innovator that is breaking business models and changing business. So it is not business at all cost. It is business for good. That's generally why women start business, much like Anita Roddick started the body shop way back when. You start business for disruption and business for good, and they see business, women, as an instrument for social progress and change. Most women, I must tell you and share and see if you relate, and what we've heard repeatedly is they do not enjoy sales, the selling process. They have stigmas around it. There's a lot of barriers around that, and we and I felt I have got to open up a place and help them see sales the way sales really is done, accomplished, achieved. It has nothing to do with being aggressive, manipulative, less than integrity, nothing to do with that. So I'm very pleased to report that we've been highly successful at showing women this is what sales really means. And if once they understand and put a process in place they love, they have a whole different perspective about it. Why women make excellent entrepreneurs and often don't realize it. Entrepreneurs are about, first and foremost, creativity. Creativity is not something that's for the arts world alone. Creativity comes within. Creativity comes from you have a passion, a desire, a pledge, a duty, because you see a different way to do something. And then you need your creativity come to the forefront and let it unfold and allow you to do that. So first and foremost, women are phenomenally creative in the way we run our homes, in the way we run our businesses, in the way that we work together. We generally continuously want to learn and learn and learn. And let me tell you, you don't stop learning in any role, as any, in any journey as an entrepreneur. And that's the beauty of it. There's always something to learn and feed that desire to constantly learn. Community-driven. Women tend to be very community-driven very much working in groups, collaborating for the greater good. They tend to have business for good values. Again, that meaning it's not profit at all costs. No, you will not go and tear down the environment and, and do anything to make money. That's not the way. It doesn't have to be. And quite frankly, we destroy our planet if we, we continue in this manner. So our whole system is dependent on people rising and understanding that business is a tool for social progress and change and for good. And all of that equals women are engines of innovation and they often do not see that. However, that is the real opportunity because they think different. And as we know, most of that thinking is not is being underutilized in corporations because we know who's at the top. It's not women. Women still continue to fight and have to prove themselves and exhaust themselves and eventually opt out. They because we think different. So we need to give women a path of success to let that innovation come to fruition and drive our complete economy in a way that it's never seen before. Pressing funding problems. Well, funding is the ultimate challenge for all entrepreneurs. It's not just women. Most women have a skewed definition of funding. And I suggest to you that that's because the market says things like, oh, women don't get funding. Women won't get loans. You know what? No entrepreneur, very rarely does any startup entrepreneur get funding, get loans. And there's a reason why. If you had all the funding, if you had a whole bucket of money and when a startup entrepreneur, you probably wouldn't spend it in the right way. A funding is a full-time job for every startup entrepreneur and funding will make or break your business. A lack of funding will continue to cause you stress and cause you to endure unhealthy states. So we know that this is the pressing problem. However, what I'm gonna share with you today is it's not funding in the way that the market, the noise is telling you what it means as a startup entrepreneur. 
So why having little money is the best way to start the entrepreneurial journey. This is truth number one. When we think of these, and you, we all hear of, about how Steve Jobs started, Bill Gates started, um, all our entrepreneurs, they didn't start with a pot of money. And because they didn't start with a pot of money, they started with a passion and a purpose and a reason and to be, get that creativity that they saw was an opportunity in the market. A startup's job is not to go and fill in grants. I'll talk about more. A startup's job is to create a desired product, to get it into the customer's hands fast, with agility and flexibility. A startup cannot waste time. A startup needs to learn from their customers as soon as possible. A startup's job is to remain lean. Lean drives the ultimate creativity and connectivity with a market. Acting lean drives revenue sooner rather than later. Being the lean machine that most of us are when we start up is the absolute perfect way of the entrepreneurial path. So here we've got a chart I put together saying, what are the funding paths and pitfalls? So the market says, okay, there's really three, three general paths. You can, can go get grants, think about grants, think about a loan, think about revenue. There's probably another column in there called angel investor that are going to give you some kind of startup money. And that generally your angels are going to be friends and family. So I'm not including them in here. But we are given a lot of thinking around, oh, well, there's loans. Wow, the federal budget came down and there's all kinds of support now for women entrepreneurs. If you really peel back the layers, there's a lot of that gender word in there. And there's very little support for women entrepreneurs. And quite frankly, that's fantastic as long as, as far as I'm concerned, because this is what you need to be the startup entrepreneur. You need to get customer learnings. You need to get an understanding of your market. You have to get a market's reactions with you. You have to learn about a market's need, get customer experience, and understand your highest level of value for that market. So then you say, okay, let's look at that. If I go through a grant process, does that help me with customer learnings? No. Does it, if I go through loans, does that help me get to know my customer? No. If I am putting together a revenue model whereby I am going to sell something, give a product and sell something to my market, is that process going to help me learn about my customers? Absolutely. Market understanding as an entrepreneur in a startup. Do, do, when filling out a grant, do you get an understanding of your market? Nope. When you're filling out a loan, does that help you understand your market? Absolutely not. And chances are the people you're working with have never started a business and driven a successful business. Does market understanding coming from revenue? Absolutely. Especially when you have a sense of urgency to get your products to market and understand how you create that revenue models, you will learn. You are incented to learn, and that is your job to learn. If you put something in the market that it's not being responded to in a positive way, then you know to tweak that. There's nothing like those learnings that will enable you to put together what your market needs at the price it can bear and to move your business forward. Another, you need market reactions. Does when filling out a grant, does that help you? Absolutely not. It's not going to tell you anything about your market. Loans, absolutely not. It's not going to tell you anything about how your market reacts to you. Revenue, absolutely. If you're putting together a revenue model, you have to get out there and promote it. If you're promoting it and you're not getting a response, guess what? You've got to change something. Your market's responding to you. Whether they have no response or response, they're giving you a reaction. And it's up to you as that startup entrepreneur to take those reactions and react to them and tweak them and put them out again. Learn your market needs. We really learn our market needs by setting and playing with our market in such, in such a way where we're communicating value. When you're communicating value, when you're writing your loan or grant or your loan application, you are not learning about your market needs. When you put together 
revenue model and you send it out there, you are going to learn because your market will respond. They'll tell you things. You'll learn from them. They may say, wow, this is interesting, but understand, listen to their butts, work with them, and then change and course correct and get back to market. <laughs> Excuse me. Customers experience. Well, once you get something out there and a customer pays for you, not a family and friend member, a brand new customer cold pays for you, guess what? That's validating what your service or product is. You have validation. And then it's up to you to take that validation, to take that, present it to other similar types of clients, listen to their experience working with you in pre-sales and when they sell, when you sell to them and when you service, understanding your highest value. I cannot express this as a critical, critical way to be successful as a startup entrepreneur. How do you know your highest value? How you know it is you put together a revenue model. A revenue model means you put together your messaging, your, your product and service, your pricing and your promotion and you put it in the market. Unless you do that, you will not understand, you will not get response, you will not be in a position to say, I now see my highest level of value. Just very, I'll give you an analogy. The creator of The Simpsons, one of the longest running TV shows, the producer says when they first started that show, it was something. They started with something. They felt after that show took six years of producing that show before they really had the product. But you have to start with something. Once you start and you start by having an audience for what you do, then you've got something. Then you have a real area segment of the market that you are working with, playing with, co-creating with, learning from and getting better as a startup entrepreneur. So how to overcome these funding problems to overcome your funding problem is to start a success, a revenue model to get out to your market. And how you do that is understand and you create a value. You decide who your critical niche, not just a niche. You're one person generally starting out. Who's your critical niche? Who needs you most? And who, what's the highest value you have? Who needs you most? Then you communicate with that market. You listen for their response. They, if they're not responding, then you know you have to change something and try something different. You have to be agile, flexible on top of it. Then you, do, then you refine your value. Then you start the whole process again. Send it out to market. Create, listen to your market. Have conversations. You drive a sales process. In a nutshell, you need to sell to your market 100% of the time. Get off the ground. That will put you in the most sustainable funding model that you could possibly imagine. You are driving it. You're not waiting for a grant. You're not waiting for a loan. You're not waiting for anything. You're an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur drives their ideas. They lead their ideas in the marketplace. They don't wait. In fact, most of us can't wait for a variety of reasons. And often it's because of the purpose and the passion, the desire we have. And the fact that we do have to get revenue is just a little added on top. It's the purpose, the passion, the desire you have to put together in a revenue model, get it out and start learning with your client. So I ask, and I ask this question all the time to the women entrepreneurs, one question, how do you feel when you get a sale? How do you feel? I feel spectacular. And I can tell you <laughs> that most women entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs, the dedicated ones, they said, I feel fantastic. There is nothing like it. So right away, you say, if you feel fantastic as an entrepreneur getting a sale, you should be an entrepreneur. If you don't feel fantastic right at that point, then I don't think entrepreneurship is for you because your life is for you to thrive in not survive. It's not a struggle. It's not a strain. If you feel fantastic when you get a sale, it's because generally you have put your heart and soul into something. You've taken a risk. You've put it out there. And somebody said, someone you didn't know said, I'm going to buy some of that. And you say, wow, that makes me feel fantastic. 
it's validated. I've got a process. I've got a model and I've got something to work with. And then you go, then you go from there and you get it, tighten it. You get it polished. You revise it, but you've got someone that said you're worth what you told me, not just you're worth it. Your value is exactly what I need. And thank you for creating your value and I need it. And I'm showing you, I need it by the exchange that I am going to give you with currency. So if we feel fantastic when we get a sale, how do you really seek and secure funding to overcome the stress, the strain, the suffering that you feel as an entrepreneur? And I say that with extreme confidence. I talk to women every single day, suffering, straining, and they're brilliant women with fantastic ideas, innovation engines who deserve and not just deserve, we need them to come and be sustainable for our economy, for our children, for the betterment of our society. So number one, forget the grants and loans. Forget everything you think about sales. Learn professional sales from people who have done it for years and in a professional setting. It's entirely different than most of your experience that causes you the stigmas about selling. And they are deep stigmas. I had them, my, I had them for several years. And when I had my first sales job at Motorola, I was even shy about saying I'm a sales rep. I was an account manager. I mean, I used all this terminology to say anything but sales rep. Let me tell you today, I am loud and I am proud that I have those skills because they have carried me through. And I'm in a position today to share with you the number one pressing problem for women entrepreneurs and funding is a lack of sales process skills understanding. And it's very easy to remedy. Profe so professional sales is very different than you think. If you don't like selling, that means you don't have the right sales process. Because as an entrepreneur whose inside is purpose to bring the value to market, nothing can stop you. And if it is something stopping you, it's the wrong, you have the wrong sales process. A sales process, you need to enjoy every step along the way. So get yourself the right sales support and resources to get to market as soon as possible. Get to market with something. Learn from that something. Get feedback from that something. Listen to that something. React to that something. Lead that something and drive yourself a revenue model that I say to every single one of the women that come to and work with us, work with me directly, however we work together. I want, and I know I'm going to be in my rocking chair. I love rockers. And in my 90 year old, and I'm going to have a lineup. And this is my greatest dream to have a constant lineup coming to me and saying, why did you only take us to a million? So we're here today and tonight and to share with you, learn, live, love being an entrepreneur as much as you love getting a new sale. It makes you happy, joyful, validated, excited. Go for it because you can do it and do it for your country. Do it for our next generation. Pave the path because you can. And that's what we're here to share with you. Not only can, this is a road for entrepreneurs to ensure your gross national happiness and move to a million because you can. I really thank you for our time here this evening and I hope you find some value in our presentation, some inspiration and some practical tactical next steps to take so you too can have a funding model that is truly sustainable. You are in, in leadership of and it's not leading you down any other path other than sustainability for your business. Wow. Thank you, Heather. I can feel the passion <laughs> in everything that you're saying. And I was looking at, I think it was the third to second, no, third to last slide. And, you know, a lot of people,
people, especially for the sales component, they do feel so uncomfortable mm-hmm. in selling their business and selling themselves. And I feel like a lot of it comes from them feeling that they're, it's like you're asking someone for a favor as opposed to thinking of it as it's an even exchange. What I'm asking you for is going to be worth what you're going to pay me. Mm-hmm. So there's usually that change in tone and change in attitude when it gets to the point of selling. And we're all in business to sell. You have to sell as an entrepreneur. So I agree with, you know, trying to get that professional help in order to get that sales conversation going so that you can get your point across and grow your business. It really is understanding if, if you don't, if you don't understand your own value, you are, and I don't mean you personally, anybody personally, but if an entrepreneur does not understand their value, does not understand the return on investment, how they can't be in a position to be as solid as I am coming across because they don't know. So therefore, that's usually the uncomfortable part. They haven't really had the opportunity because they don't have the experience. They haven't ever had to, but really understand what is your value? How do you put that together? How is that measured? Every single time I sit down with an entrepreneur and we put her value prop, she is flabbergasted because she's never thought of it like that. She's never thought of the equation of what that value and how that translates. And that once you really understand your value, you cannot not hold, you cannot not talk about what you do in a very powerful way to the people you know that need you the most. I will not. You see my passion? This is after working, I don't know, 13 hours today. It's passion because I know the need. I know the pressing need. I know that the mythology and the misdirections women are told and over and over about, and it's complete one word for it for me. And when they understand, oh my goodness, I had no understanding that when I did that, when I go in and I do this mindfulness for a corporation, that this is the result. Oh my goodness. So often it's putting together the value proposition, really being detailed about that, understanding what that is, and then presenting in a way that they say, oh my God, I've never looked at it like that. And now I see that For example, mine is I will save a woman entrepreneur, not only help get her on her million dollar path, I will save her two to three years, two to three years. No question. What advice do you give people who seem to be very strong in sales, but they're selling a million things as opposed to focusing on maybe one or two? I think that's a really good question. And why it's once they understand there's, a, there's something called the product adoption model. Every product, every service, everything, B2B, B2C, b to government is sold and it's adopted by the market. So it's not really a sell-to model. It's how the market on aggregate adopts new things. Because women are generally bringing innovation and disruption, they completely, if you follow how the market adopts you, you go after your innovators. If you gain that understanding, you look at your business entirely different. And it's not about selling. It's about understanding how the market's going to adopt you and who you need to appeal to in what fashion, in what way. I can tell you most entrepreneurs have a very difficult, oh, no, but I can take care of anybody. No, you can't. You're one person and the more critical and defined you can be, the more power you have and the leverage to be the person you need to be for your clients. However, that comes from understanding how markets adopt products and services. So the adoption market was done in 1955. It is the most widely cited adoption theory management across all management texts today. And it is the least understood and talked about that I saw in the market. What I saw were lots of organizations saying, oh, women go network, go network. Well, oh my gosh, you can't network if you don't understand what your value is that you're networking about. How uncomfortable is that? So to your point, to me, it's about understanding proven theories, disciplined ways, and that's how markets get adopted. What about, uh, I was actually speaking to a friend earlier, and there's that 
question of do I sell to the list that I currently have, even though they might not be buyers right now, like find out what they really want and make them buy? Or do I go out and build a list from what I'm trying to sell? Like, yeah, great question. I think there's no option. And if you're a startup entrepreneur that does have to get revenue, you do it simultaneously. And that's understanding again, if you know the value, if you know who your critical market is, you know what you're offering your critical market, and then you find where they are, you will always find that out of 100 people, X percent will be ready for your products and services. X percent will be interested, but not ready today. So you nurture those. X percent will not be interested. You go back to those maybe in a year down the road. And um, some of them will just say, well, it kind of sounds interesting, but, you know, just keep me in the loop. So every, it's all, it is mathematics in terms of, and you won't know until you get out there and see, but there's always a percentage, always a percentage that will be interested, provided you're targeting the right products to the right market with the right need, with the right price. There's always, always a need to service and take care of. I feel like I'm the one with all the questions, but please do feel free to <laughs> questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. I'm going to keep asking questions because I do have a couple more. Um, how do you find out the language that your network or your list likes so that they can purchase from you? Because, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty direct. Yeah. Now, will I attract people who can understand how I communicate? Not everyone does. So how do I figure out how my core group would communicate? Well, for example, to me, it's about understanding the needs of your market. And it's your job as an entrepreneur to be able to communicate so they understand you. And how you do that generally is understanding what they're looking for in the manner what they are. So for example, just, I, I had a gal, I've had many, many clients. So I had this gal come to me and she was, uh, or she is a representative for investors group and she sells financial solutions. And she was one of the hardest working women I'd ever seen. And she said, you know what? In her branch, they had 170 reps and she was 150th. And she said, I follow, I do exactly what they tell me. I do everything. I'm working 14 hour days and it's not going for, it's not, it's not. And I'm going to lose my job. And she says, but I know I can do this. So she had all the support manager, but guess what? Her sales process was not, and she wasn't communicating in a way that she felt comfortable. She came to me. We put her within seven months, she was number two because we defined two markets for her. Instead of going after everybody, we defined midwives and Armenians because she was Armenian and she used to be a midwife. And I said, look, your specialty is, and that's understanding what a combination of her expertise is and a combination of needs in the market. And we did mapping of that and found those were the two critical niches. And we put together models presentations for those two markets, those two markets only. Those are markets she felt so empowered because she understood them herself. She didn't have to learn any new language. She didn't have to reposition to them. She had the expertise. All I did was help her pull it out, funnel it, focus it, direct it, and she's number two. That's pretty cool because it's kind of her, is transferring her past life and yeah. making it work for what she is trying to do for her future. Yeah, it's about leverage, right? It's leverage. Great. You can go and sell financial solutions, but who really needs it? What, what expertise do you and what do you enjoy? Mm -hmm. And we found out that midwives, for example, they make a lot of money. They have a lot of crazy hours. They really do need help with their financial. They have to keep track of things. They were their own contractors. So she's able to go in and really take care of them. And they relate to her because she understood their business. So then her probability, they look at her like a true trusted advisor, bringing them solutions. And she, that helped her increase her, obvious, her success rate substantially different than before was, Hey, here's the, you know, here, just go out. Here's the drill. Here's the presentation. Go out to have coffee meetings. I said, you don't need to have coffee meetings. There's no, you don't need people to bring you coffee. 
<laughs> I really don't like coffee meetings. I say no to them a lot. Yeah. And that's usually my advice to a lot of people. Have a quick phone chat before you have a coffee meeting yeah. and make sure you stick to the time period in your phone chat. 15 minute limit, start, stop. Then you can figure out if you need a coffee meeting after. Right. And that would be beforehand. You would understand and outline your sales process. So you said, okay, here's my buyer. Here's my market. Here is my sales process. We have a qualification. Then I do an assessment. I do a proposal and a presentation, but you get prepared for that before you go to market. Mm -hmm. And so I used to be a girl guide and a brownie, and I couldn't agree more in that the motto be prepared means everything. If you take thoughtful time to prepare for your market, then you will increase your probability and decrease the time it takes to do revenue by months, if not two years. And it's that preparation, I say to women, it's very similar like, we want to build a house. And instead of, uh, we know we need a foundation, but however, what we often do building our business, we go right to putting the wallpaper on the walls. I want a website. I want a business card. I want a brand. I want a logo. That's called decor promotion. So we don't build the foundation. We don't build the walls. We want to just put the wallpaper on. And then you start swirling and swirling and you do not you cannot get solid if you had a home obviously with just the wallpaper so it's that thoughtful preparedness that when you do it put your model together exactly what you're pointing out i would know well i have conversation then i know i go to proposal presentation then proposal and it's that preparedness that's called leadership that leadership is what truly attracts your market and shows and demonstrates that you're a thought leader and an expert in your domain you're working in. So my final big question for you, well, second to last question. <laughs> so, you know, you're promoting happiness and people feel happy when they sell. How do you tackle the person, which probably is a very small percentage of women, it's a lot of men in this percentage gap, but the person who is doing great at sales, everything is going great with business, but somehow they don't seem to be happy. Like there are people who are motivated and they want more, I get that. But people who are not happy with what they have and still want to, you know, find, I, I don't know how to put it, but. Um, well, number one, I don't know that I've ever met an entrepreneur that's selling and they're not really happy. I haven't met that person yet. I'm sure they're there, but as an entrepreneur, and that's what I focus in, um, that's usually a very happy moment. Yes, that brings challenges because then you have to have operations and you have to have your delivery system. And there's all, I'm not saying this goes without challenges. There's challenges all along the way. It's how you approach them. Uh, but if you're not happy and it doesn't make you happy to meet a customer's needs, maybe you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. And that is one of your first slides. You know, are you happy when you sell? Yes or no? Yes, entrepreneur, no, maybe not. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so Heather, let everyone know what you have coming up, how they can reach you. I will also, just so everyone knows, I will also get all of Heather's uh, contact information or anything she has to offer and I will send it out in an email to not only the participants, but to all the registrants of tonight's webinar. And this webinar is going to be available for replay on the Canadian Small Business Women uh, YouTube channel. Oh, well, thank you. That's so kind of you. So, um, and uh, we do so many different things, but really our heart and soul program is called Moving to a Million. We deliver it private one-on-one. -on -one and we deliver it in group environments. We recently last year opened up a location in Santiago, Chile, uh, because I knew that we we're going global and Canada, Chile have a very unique trade amendment to support one another's women entrepreneurs. We are going to be working with a lovely in incubator um, that's focusing on a woman's program in Durham. So there's a variety of ways that you can participate as well. So I really encourage the best way and we is to contact us is to, we do have a telephone and it is answered. 
I have, a, I have a, a gal named Karen. She answers it because that's a level of commitment. And that's what we believe is really important to start off having conversation. We encourage anyone that's interested and we call them prosperity chats because that's what we're here to chat about. And we're here to mobilize. So anybody from and we offer from your group, anyone a prosperity chat, all they have to do is call us. We do have a website, of course. So I'll call us our number 647-347. Four four three three, live answer. Um, outside of that, our website is women on the move dot club. C L U B, women on the move dot club. And we did. I purposely did dot club because when I opened this business, I knew it is going to be a global business. I want the Canadian women to lead other women around the world. And that's what we've already started doing, for example, in Santiago, Chile. So dot club is the only file extension that is not associated with a country. I like that. Yeah. So we're pure innovation here. Uh, and most people dot what what because they've never heard it before I still can't believe it hasn't been adopted but I'm sticking with it so women on the move dot club go to our website and there is a contact info form you get a feel for us a little bit on the website but it's really through that conversation so we can listen where you are with your you know where you're at with your business instead of doing the traditional strength weakness opportunity analysis we call get rid of that we're all about design thinking we do soar analysis so we want to know from you what your strengths opportunity aspiration and results are that you want and then we have conversation and see if we make sense for you if it makes sense and timing for you and if it doesn't we're quite aware of potential other areas or other resources out there to help you but once again, we're really solid for the woman that is committed, dedicated, and wants to scale her business. Most women in Canada tend to hover around thirty or 50000 a year. And that, I know, is a result of social stigmas, blocks, barriers, etc. So if you really are serious and you want to erase those, eliminate those, and you want to join us in the rise of moving to a million, please give us a call. It's our honor to talk with you. And you want to say that number once again? I will send it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Our <laughs> number is 647-347-4433. I'm in the Business Accelerator tonight. It's, uh, I just cannot tell you, it's just the most vibrant place. It's full of color. It's full of life. It's full of these women and their energy. And, um, and it is my intention to scale this across Canada. So we're definitely looking for leaders who either have gone to a million or close to a million and want to bring this and the program and facilitate it in your uh, different communities. It's time to spread gross national happiness for Canadian women. I love it. And I love in your background, there's a banner that says enthusiasm. Is that what it says? enthusiasm and inspiration so you are clearly enthusiastic and clearly an inspiration to a lot of people and I cannot thank you enough for doing all this yes I will definitely send you out information on Heather how to contact her Heather if uh, Karen has any information that she can send me over I will send everything out in an email I also have one final offer because we are hosting our Niagara Small Business Seminar on the 16th of this month. So excited. <laughs> and I hope it's great weather. We are going to offer on this chat the first three people to email us. And hopefully you're in the Niagara area. We will give you a pair of tickets to the event. We have three amazing speakers and we're going to talk about money matters. You're going to learn about Bitcoin, about no dollars marketing, and about the mindset of making money. So that kind of ties in to what Heather is speaking mm -hmm. about. So it is Wednesday. It is nice out. The sun is down, but it's still time to go outside and enjoy the weather. Mm -hmm. And we are making very good time. So I thank you all for joining us. I thank you again, Heather. I am looking forward to seeing where everything goes with Moving to Millions and especially with the 
program that you have with the incubator in Chile. Oh, that's fantastic. We're only taking that and scaling it with the six largest mining companies in the world. It's done. Uh, that's going to be great. I'm excited. I'm very excited to find out more. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you for your great work that you do. And, and, you know, it's people like you that are here to help and spread our good cheer and uh, what we really need to do to help women entrepreneurs succeed. That is a great way to end the night. Thank you all. Thank you, Heather. Have bye. a very good night. Okay. Bye. bye, everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye. <laughs>